Bonjour uh, tout le monde. Uh, hello everyone. I'm uh, Octave Cornea. I am uh, the director of the Centre de Recherche Mathematique, and uh, I'll wait a little bit till the room uh, fills up. <laughs> um, so it's great to see you all here today. Um, we are starting at uh, CRM a new uh, distinguished series of uh, lectures in applied mathematics. Um, so this is a series that uh, uh, is initiated um, by uh, the CRM, and uh, it's uh, set up by an uh, organizing uh, uh, committee that uh, I want to thank. Uh, Morgan Craig is one of the members, and uh, Felix Wok the, uh, from uh, Unistel Laval. It's also another member, Erika Moody and uh, Jean-Christophe Nam are the other two members. And the first year, uh, the first conference inaugural one is on um, uh, math uh, biology. And um, it's a series that uh, um, is supported by a new program of the FRQNT, so the Fonds de Recherche du Québec uh, Nature et Technologie, that is called Strategia. And um, in any case, I don't want to make long speeches. I'm very happy to have uh, two speakers today. So uh, Ruth Baker and Alison Hill. And uh, I'll pass the uh, mic to uh, Morgan, who will say more important things. <laughs> I mean, hopefully. So thank you very much. Thanks, Octav. So I want to welcome you all today. And particularly, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Um, so we're really excited to have Ruth Baker with us, who's a professor of applied mathematics at the Mathematical Institute at the University of Oxford. And she leads a group focused on developing and applying, applying sorry, mathematical and computational and statistical methods to understand key problems in cell and developmental biology. Um, Dr. Baker was awarded in the Whitehead Prize of the London Mathematical Society in 2014 for outstanding contributions to the fields of mathematical biology. She was elected fellow of the Royal Society of Biology in 2019 and in 2020 uh, became a fellow of the Institute of Mathematics and its applications. So today she's going to talk to us about integrating mechanistic models and computational statistics and machine learning to provide new insights. And I'm really excited to hear from her. So thank you very much and please welcome Ruth Baker. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Morgan, for the introduction and, and to, to, to both of you for the invitation. So. I don't think there's going to be a huge amount of machine learning in this, but we'll see how we go and how far we get. There's a bit at the end, um, and if we make it that far, great. And if not, I'm happy to talk about it at um, another time over the next few days. Um, what I do want to do, here we go, make the pages turn, um, is just to maybe introduce um, who we are in the group and what we do, what our research focus is. Um, and so Morgan gave a bit of an introduction, but more particularly, a lot of what we focus on in, in our group is trying to understand the mechanisms that enable uh, a population of cells to migrate coherently as a group. Um, and then how the sort of the processes that drive collective cell motility combine with other processes, for example, cell proliferation, cell death to give rise to very complicated biological phenomena. And we sort of mostly work in the context of developmental biology, partly because it's fascinating in its own right, but partly because I think um, learning about how tissues form de novo is very, um, I think, useful in understanding what happens or you know, how we maintain homeostatic conditions. Um, also sort of how we might think about rebuilding uh, tissues following um, sort of wounding and what might be going wrong in contexts and pathologies such as cancer. So we've got some applications in wound healing, regenerative medicine and cancer as well. Okay, and typically, um, as for a sort of lot of people in mathematical biology, we try and make progress in, in terms of understanding uh, sort of biology by a cycle which we call predict, test, refine, predict. So by that, oftentimes what I mean is that we might have a set of predictions, so hypotheses um, that come from a series of observations and a series of experiments, there'll be hypotheses about how a particular phenomenon works or how it's driven. And the idea with mathematical modeling is to essentially encode those hypotheses mathematically into a model. And then through a process of analyzing that model, either kind of pen and paper mathematics or computationally, 
then we can understand whether our hypotheses are consistent with the observations that we are seeing kind of in the lab. Um, and I always say this, but almost all of the time you learn more when your observations are inconsistent with the hypotheses of your mathematical model, because that tells you something about your understanding so far isn't quite correct. Okay. But the beauty then of having a mathematical model is that you can go in and you can perturb those hypotheses or you can add sort of new bits in and you can sort of continue refining your understanding until the predictions of your model are consistent with the observations that you have. And then again, the beauty of the model is it allows you to design experiments to kind of test the level, next level of understanding. So this is this loop I'm interested in. Okay, so how, I can't see what slide's going next. It's always a bit of a guess. Okay, that happens online. All right, so here's some examples of where of how we've done this in the past. So in, um, can we get rid of the bit at the top? Or is that stuck forever? The, um, the bit where you have to click okay, do you know? It's not on my laptop, actually, and it's not on this one. <laughs> I can't see how to do it. It doesn't matter. I can just read. I can read you the. I can read you the title. So the title says cranial neural crest cell migration. So in a collaboration with Paul Kalisa, he's at now at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. They're interested in understanding the collective migration of a population of cells as known as the neural crest, and in particular the cranial neural crest. Uh, oops. And so what happens is that these neural crest cells delaminate from what is the precursor of the spinal cord called the neural tube, and they migrate out and around the sides of the growing embryo. And the idea is that they have to reach some distal target sites known as the branchial arches, but they also have to distribute all along their migratory pathway. And if that process essentially doesn't happen properly, then you see a number of developmental anomalies. So ones that you might have heard of include cleft lip or cleft palate. Okay. So coming into this collaboration with Paul and his team, the hypothesis, um, if you like, from experiments this was that a cell-generated gradient of positional information was success sufficient for successful migration. So what do we mean by this? We mean that the secretion of a growth factor called VEG F to the local microenvironment as uh, cells delaminate from the neural tube, which would be here in my, uh, in my model, and enter the migratory domain, then essentially they uptake that VEGF locally. The VEGF is diffusive, and so that what that establishes is a gradient in VEGF concentration. Cells like VEGF, they want to move up gradients and concentration, so they kind of move further into areas of high VEGF concentration, they deplete that uh, VEGF, and so on and so on. And so the gradient moves um, and the cells invade. So what you can see in this schematic is cells entering here, uh, as they delaminate from the neural tube, they're creating a gradient, which is in this um, sort of blue shading, and they follow that gradient. Okay. Um, but what you can sort of see if you watch that, that, that movie repeat itself is that although the kind of leading cells are invading very nicely, back here at the back, all the VEGF is being consumed by the cell, so there essentially isn't a gradient for the cell population to follow. And the upshot of that is that you get all these cells building up right here at the, the neural tube at the entrance to the migratory domain and uh, collective migration fails. So we kind of like, okay, what's going to happen here and, and what are we missing? So the hypothesis that we came up with in terms of the mathematical model was there has to be some kind of population heterogeneity that's enabling cells to invade successfully. And the idea is that you've got a population of cells right out here at the front, which are called the leader cells, which essentially sense and respond to this gradient in order to successfully invade. And then the subsequent cells are going to be known as followers. Uh, we're not very inventive. Um, and essentially what they're doing is following directional cues from the leaders. And you can see if they, we simulate, so this is a, should have said, a hybrid cell-based PVE model. If we simulate the model in the context of having leaders and followers, so some population heterogeneity, then we can see that we have successful invasion. So this is a prediction that came from the mathematical model. And then Paul and his team went back into the lab and what they did was they essentially uh, dissected these um, sort of chick embryos. Um, and so they extracted the kind of cells within this invading stream. They chopped it up into different pieces and they looked at gene expression in different regions along this invading stream. And what you could see that was quite convincingly, these leader cells right out at the front of the stream um, had different gene expression to the following cells. And in particular, they have upregulated guidance factor receptors. They have um, upregulated expressions of things called MMPs, which break down the, the kind of the matrix allowing them to invade. And some coherence, whereas the training cells expressed 
different coherence. So this is a really nice example. And, you know, we've been collaborating with Paul for um, sort of on the order of, well, getting towards 20 years now, right, of kind of this feedback between modeling, experiment, modeling and experiment that really allowed us to kind of better understand the process. And it's still ongoing work today. In a, another example, we worked with a team in Oxford, so Shankar Srinivas and his lab, to understand another instance of collective cell migration in the early embryo. So this time, this is a cross-section of the early embryo. This is a rendering of one. What you see is you get migration of a population of cells called the AVE. They're initially down here at the distal tip of the embryo, and they have to migrate up and towards what you can see is almost like a waist here. And wherever that population of cells ends up essentially defines where the head's going to be. So it gives the, uh, the, the developing embryo polarity, it defines the head tail axis. And you can do experiments where you make the, the migrating AVE cells express a green fluorescent protein so you can see them. Um, and you notice two things. When they migrate, they stay together as a group and they need to do that. But also as they migrate, you see these rosette structures forming. So what I should have said right at the start is that this is kind of quite a striking example of cell migration because this is a cell, essentially a one cell thick layer of cells that are contiguous, they're bound together, right? And this population of cells essentially migrates through this intact epithelium. So they're sort of pushing the cells around them out of the way, but always maintaining this sheet-like behavior. Um, so these rosette structures are um, kind of sort of quite fascinating. They're not something you normally see in tissues in equilibrium. And actually, at the time we did this work, I think they'd really only been seen before in Drosophila, so the, the, early, the fruit fly. And Shankar and his team were kind of excited to find them because we hadn't really observed many instances of them before in biology. But at the same time, they didn't think that they were sort of, you know, they had a particular use, right? So their hypothesis was just that Rosettes were just a sort of passive response of the tissue to migration. So to try and test whether this was true or not, we uh, developed what's called a vertex model, a cell-based model. So cells are essentially represented as polygons that tessellate the plane, or in our case, tessellate the surface, if you can do this, of an ellipsoid. And we labeled a population of our cells down here at the distal tip as the AVE population, and we let them migrate up until around the waist of the embryo. Um, and try to see what happens. And what was really striking about this study was that if you, in your model, don't let these rosette structures form, so this would be a time series down at the bottom here, you can see that the population essentially breaks apart. They can't stay together as a coherent group, right? Maintain. It's, it's a, maybe a very naive question. No, no, uh, no, no, no. So what's the rule for this migration? So it's, it has to be some... So we tested a range of things, and it, uh, yeah, it's a good question. At this point, there wasn't anything other than um, either one or several nodes of a particular cell had a propensity to want to move uh, north, if you like, in this on, on this on this surface. So it was very, very simple in the sense that we weren't asking questions about um, what the cues were for migration. We were just testing what happens if they tried to make migrate, uh, what happens. Um, it's something I haven't really said, but you can see in this schematic here is that between the top and the bottom halves of this kind of developing um, embryo, and this is actually extra embryonic tissue, it's not going to form part of the embryo itself, there's a real difference between the sort of stiffness and the ability of the, the cells to be able to move and rearrange. So once they reach the kind of halfway point, they sort of get stuck. There's, there's very little cell rearrangements in the top, it's much more static. Um, so they had a propensity to just want to migrate north, but nothing else for this story. Um, go on. The uh, uh, in the uh, Maybe polygons. Yeah, uh, yeah. The polygons are not equal. No. So, so, so what's the what's the equations governing it all? Yeah, because it, so there were this this kind of model, a vertex-based model, was quite well established in the literature at this point uh, to represent these kinds of tissues. And effectively, you've got a potential um uh that sort of essentially so you use that to define a force. Um, and that those forces at each of the vertices, and that gives you the dynamic um, accessory system of ODEs, right, that you solve. And there's terms within that potential that look at area or volume, depending on 2D or 3D regulation of cells, looks at um, contractility, so the, the perimeter of the cell. And there's also a term in there that represents cell-cell adhesion by looking at how long edges need to be. So these cells are essentially deformable, but they really want to maintain a target area. So yeah, so I 
um, it's, it's a fairly well-established model. The contribution here was to put it onto the surface of an ellipsoid, so put it into 3D for the first time, um, and to really use it to test this hypothesis. Um, so very, very, very simple, but the, the, the kind of striking results were that effectively, if you don't let these rosette structures form, then the population breaks apart. But if you allow them to form, they, they migrate very nicely as a group. Um, and so then Shankar and his team went back into the lab and you can develop a mutant um, and it's a mutant in the planar cell polarity pathway. That's not really sort of important right now, but the important thing, the important thing is that these, this mutant, <coughs> um, what should I say, this mutant um, can't actually form rosette structures. Okay, so these, these, these uh, configurations here aren't able to form. And what you see is that in that context then the cells essentially can't migrate together coherently as a group. And so the take home message is that these rosette structures are actually necessary. And that we think that in some senses, what they help to do is um, help buffer against the kind of huge perturbations that are being caused by these cells trying to move through an intact sheet. So buffer against these, this equilibrium. So um, I didn't want to spend too long on these, but the main point I wanted to make here is that I think via these cycles of kind of developing the model, refining the model, making predictions and doing experiments, then we were able to essentially derive some new biological insights and have hidden most of the, the, the mathematics. But I wanted to convince you it was there. And in particular, what I wanted to demonstrate to you is that we didn't necessarily have to do much quantitative in terms of comparison between models and data. We were still able to provide new insights. Oh, okay. So maybe when we talk about the art of mathematical modeling, this was sort of traditionally, whether it was kind of these cell-based models that I was describing or systems of differential equations or stochastic models, this was very much what we were talking about in terms of developing a model, trying to think about um, or gain expertise in the art of, if you like, thinking about what the relevant level of the mathematical model was for the data and how to kind of develop a model at the right level to get new insights. Um, but what I want to talk about today is essentially maybe over the past 10 or so years, what has changed about this field? And as a result of those changes, should we now be aiming to do anything differently? So what do I mean by that? Um, what I wanted to draw your attention to was uh, <laughs> a statistic down here. So this was, I don't know, 2017, a study by the Royal Society, which said that 90% of the world's data has been generated in the last five years. And that was in 20, what did I say, 2017. So in 2022, I'm sure that's even more a starker statistic, right? And in particular, I think what we've really, really witnessed um, in cell and developmental biology is a transformation of that discipline from something that was very, very qualitative. So experiments were conducted in pretty low end numbers, like, you know, triplicate maybe if we were lucky. Um, and sort of um, the results of those experiments were analyzed very much as a qualitative kind of general trends and behaviors type of way. And I think that that's no longer the case. Um, and I think we're really witnessing, and not just in cell and developmental biology, but in whole swathes of kind of biology, um, a real transformation to a data, data rich age. And so for us in particular, now we've got sort of data that is kind of from the omics level, looking at molecular interactions, um, so through the sort of cellular level to the tissue, to the organ, um, and to, the, to the, the whole organism and beyond. And I think that the real question <laughs> that we need to ask ourselves is how we make sensible that data to gain maximal new biological insights. And in general, I think there's a real danger in the field um, experimentally that um, we do experiments because they're possible without necessarily thinking about what they're going to tell us and how we might kind of get full insight from that data. And I want to talk today about maybe some ways to do that. Um, and what I'm going to try and argue, although we probably won't get to the machine learning, real machine learning bits of it, is that um, I guess the way in which the field has been going, I think, in biology is there's been a real trend towards applying machine learning uh, kind of approaches to sort of to, to sort of wade through the swathes of data and try and kind of uh, maybe correlate input with output. Um, and maybe that mathematical modeling of the kinds that I was showing you of falling, the danger it could fall by the wayside because it's not necessarily always well equipped to deal with those kind of large uh, amounts of data. And what I want to try and convince you today is that we shouldn't have to kind of choose between one or the other, but what we should be doing is trying to think about embracing the strengths of both. So for me, the real strength of mechanistic mathematical modeling 
is that we can really probe mechanisms, but we usually do that in quite a sort of small scale or, or on a fine scale with, you know, um, so very focused problems. So we're not necessarily always very good at the much bigger picture, whereas machine learning is great for the big data, maybe bigger picture aspects of this um, and less good for the interpretable um, and we can we can we can discuss and argue this uh, the interpretable aspects. So let's try and put them together and see what we can do. Having said, okay, so the, the sort of switch of our group, uh, the, so the focus of our group has been come to thinking about how we combine mechanistic mathematical models and tools from often computational statistics and machine learning to provide new insights. Having said all that, I'm going to go right back to basics and tell you where how we started learning how to do this. So quickly realized that um, learning how to do all that in the context of in vivo um, experiments and very complicated biological kind of phenomena was maybe not the right thing to do, or at least too hard for me to think about. So we essentially went back and started to think about in vitro assays because they're much more controllable and the data are maybe much simpler. So the kinds of assays that I was interested in thinking about as a, a, um, a barrier assay, I'll probably talk more about these more tomorrow, uh, where you essentially grow cells to confluence inside a sort of cookie cutter, and when they've reached some density that you, you kind of you're, you're happy with, you take away the the barrier and you watch as the population proliferates, it moves and it grows to fill available space. You might also talk about this a bit today. Think about a scratch assay, where you grow a population of cells to confluence, and then at time zero you take a pipette or a tip or a sharp object and you scrape away a portion of cells in the middle of the dish simulates a wound and you look at uh, the dynamics as the cells grow and proliferate to close that wound. And maybe the simplest of all is a greater confluence assay where you seed cells at relatively low density in a dish and you just watch as they grow and they fill the available space. So we wanted to know, uh, can we develop models of these assays and can we connect them with data and what do we learn as a process for doing this? This is kind of 101 for how to think about doing this in, in my world. And maybe also want to convince you that um, you know we can still learn a lot from this. And actually, these kinds of assays are used really widely still today in basic studies. Um, so, as an example, studies that maybe want to screen for potential new therapeutic compounds, you can do this. At, uh, you can do hundreds of these assays at once in a single a single uh, plate. Um, or um, big sort of gene knockdown studies that want to explore what happens as you knock down a whole plethora of genes one at a time. Okay, so they might be simple, but they're still really quite useful and they're used a lot. Okay, um, so our basic first question, can I build a really, really simple model of one of these assays? Can I calibrate it to the data? So could I estimate the model parameters? Um, and can I do that in a way that helps us quantify uncertainty and any predictions that we make? And in fact, I should maybe have said that one of the things that we really try to focus on within the group is this quantification of uncertainty. OK, so if I'm going to um, sort of uh, try to um, even think about building a model, how confident am I in the model that I've built to describe a particular thing? How confident am I in the predictions that I'm making with my model or how confident am I in the um, the, 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 the parameter estimates that I've got. So we try to work a lot in a Bayesian framework where uh, we're gonna have data D from an experimental system. We've got parameters theta in our model and we access this posterior distribution of parameters theta given data D in terms of the product of the likelihood and the prior. Um, and typically we try to assume that we don't know very much uh, a priori, so the prior is uh, not, not informative. Okay. So can we do this in practice and what data do we need to collect? So I'm going to start with the simplest cell-based model. So my cells live on a lattice, um, it's a square lattice, and they move around on that lattice and only one cell can occupy each lattice site at a time. And they can do two things. They can uh, divide, so give rise to a daughter cell at a rate PP, and they can move around at 8 PM. So this is effectively just an exclusion process model. And what we know is that if we simulate this model uh, using computer, then effectively we see growth to confluence eventually on the lattice, but that the spatial structure of the system changes as the parameters change relative to one another. So in particular, as I increase the rate at which cells proliferate relative to how quickly they move, we can see spatial clustering develop 
So I want to use data from one of these growth per confluence experiments. This one's from a breast cancer cell line. Um, and I want, to say, I want to be able to essentially say something about how quickly the cells are moving and how quickly they're proliferating by connecting model and data. Um, so I've got two parameters. I've got data that looks like this. And I'm going to use approximate Bayesian computation because although this model is very, very simple, uh, the likelihood is intractable. It's really just a simulation-based approach. It couldn't be simpler, um, very, where a very large number of times, where large depends on uh, many things that we, we can talk about later, what you're going to do is you're going to sample uh, a set of parameters from your prior distribution. You simulate your model using that parameter, uh, those parameters, and then you basically evaluate what the agreement is between your model and your data. And typically, you need to use that, do that using um, some summary statistics of the data and a distance function. So a summary statistic in my experiment might be how many cells are in the dish, for example. Um, and then I assign a weight to that parameter depending on the distance. So typically kind of zero or one, depending on uh, how close uh, the, the model is to the data. Um, so the first thing we looked at is kind of what summary statistics are useful in telling us something about these parameter values. So what you're seeing in one of these plots here is um, the, the posterior distribution. Um, so this is the parameter PM, the movement rate on the horizontal axis and the uh, proliferation rate on the vertical axis. And so this was for in silico data and the dashed lines just tell you the parameters we use to generate the in silico data. And then the white dots, if you can see them, are just accepted samples from our ABC algorithm, which we then smooth using a kernel um, to generate a smooth posterior. And so what you can hopefully see here is if we include trajectory, uh, if we include trajectory data in our summary statistics, so tracking how far cells move or how tortuous their trajectories are, then we can get a very, very tightly peaked posterior about the parameters that we use to generate the data. But on the other hand, if we don't include trajectory data, then we can learn um, very uh, precise estimates for the, um, the proliferation rate, but there's, we don't learn very much really about what the movement rate of the, the cells is. So in this particular experiment, um, we need to essentially include trajectory data to be able to estimate most parameters. Why is that important to know? In some cases, that's really easy to do, and in some cases, that isn't, right? Because what you've got to do is actually track cells, and I'll show you why in a minute. OK, well, this is actually, maybe this is why. <laughs> what we wanted to do is kind of use this method to infer these parameters for two different cell lines. So the top one is the, the one that you saw from the movie before, which is a breast cancer cell line. And you can see these cells, they're quite circular. They're quite easy to pick out. It's pretty easy to track these cells kind of uh, using a computer without thinking too hard about it. On the other hand, the second cell line that we had was a fibroblast cell line. And what you can see, these cells are really, really strange shapes. They evolve full nodding all, over, all, all the time. It's really hard to track these cells, right, apart from manually. And in fact, for this, my PhD student just said, okay, I'm just going to sit here for a week and I'm going to track these cells because at least the job is, is done. Okay, what happens when you try to estimate the parameters for these two different cell lines? So I'm going to use the posteriors you get from two different summary statistics to highlight some differences. So if you use the number of cells to access or to try and estimate what the, the parameter values are, you can see that you get a good estimate for the proliferation rate. And for both these cell lines, actually, um, they're proliferating at about the same rate. There's not much difference. On the other hand, if you look at distance moved by something like mean squared displacement, you can see that there's quite big differences in their, uh, their, their movement rates. So there's about a factor of 10 different. And in fact, the fibroblasts are moving kind of uh, a, 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 an order of magnitude quicker than the breast cancer cell line is. And in fact, what we predict for this cell line, and I think I took out the figure and now realize that was stupid, was that the fibroblast population is actually going to grow to confluence much quick, much quick, quicker than the, this invasive kind of quite aggressive breast cancer cell line, purely because they're actually moving faster, not because they're proliferating quicker. And the idea is that essentially, because they're moving quicker, they move into space to allow them to, to proliferate and to continue to do that. OK, so short story with a very, very simple model um, and by careful calibration to data, we can learn something about these different cell lines. The real disadvantage, as I hinted at before, of this growth, the confluence assay was that we needed to track individual cells to do that. And I don't want to have to do that except in very special circumstances, right, which are generally not having much data, not having to do this often. 
so we kind of asked we asked the question from from you know a, a model based design perspective could changing to an assay like the scratch assay with non uniform initial conditions help the thing and the short story is that yes it does okay so if you look at trying to parameterize a growth to confluence assay, which has essentially is on average spatially homogeneous to start with, if you look at trying to parameterize that, as we've already seen, without including trajectory data, so without tracking bad, without tracking cells, we do a bad job. If we track cells, we do a great job. On the other hand, if you start with a scratch assay, which has got this initial spatial heterogeneity in it, you can see that um, even in the absence of trajectory data, we can still do a really good job at ent identifying both the model parameters. Take home message being that essentially experimental design really, really matters. Um, I think it matters, and I'll talk about this more tomorrow, uh, more tomorrow. It matters in terms of the level of complexity of the model that you can build, and it matters in terms of how hard you might have to work to collect quantitative data from. Uh, your sort of experimental observations. Okay, so next question. Um, what happens if the data set is really, really big and can we still make progress? Okay, so this was kind of very, very small data sets. We had a few, a few replicates and if necessary, we can, um, you know, track the cells, count the cells by hand. It's not ideal, but you can do it. Um, and the model is sufficiently simple that we could <laughs> simulate a million times in in um you know maybe not an hour or two um so what happens if that's not the case so we moved on to thinking about a new project where the data was part of a different it's part of a study that's published elsewhere but the authors helpfully uh put all the data made all the data available in a separate publication so this is a what i would call fairly big data set maybe not big big data but certainly big for us, which was a genome-wide RNA eye screen of endothelial cells. What does that mean? It means that effectively what the authors did in this study was they went through um, you know, more than 100,000 different genes. They knocked them down one at a time and they did an experiment. And that experiment was designed to try and test whether that particular gene impacted essentially um, migration. Okay, what was the experiment? It was one of these nice wound healing experiments that we saw before, where you grow the cells to uh, confluence, you scratch to make a hole in the middle of the, the dish or in the cell population, and you watch as the population grows back to confluence. Um, okay, so this was a, a big data for us experiment because there were thousands of different genes or hundreds of thousands of different genes that were knocked down. Um, and what the authors did was they made the scratch at time t equals zero and they took an image and then they came back 24 hours later and they took a second image. And their idea was that they could just use the extent of wound closure, so how much does the area of the wound decreased, to say something um, or to identify or known and novel components of signaling pathways that regulate migration. So when we looked at this, we thought, um, yeah, kind of on a very high level, that's what you're going to get, right? Because you can see if wound healing is disturbed. But I think you miss a lot of information about the mechanisms that are effectively um, sort of leading to this uh, acceleration or um, deceleration of wound healing. So our idea was to try and see whether we could use a mathematical model in tandem with this data set to ask what the functional impact of knocking down these different genes is. So using the model to bridge between essentially genotype and phenotype, um, and then begin to ask questions like, can we group genes according to the mechanisms impacted by the knockdown? So we can we try and uh, maybe, uh, as a long-term goal, associate genes together in different signaling pathways. Okay, so this was fast forwarding a little bit. Um, and so we thought, that well we were confident that we could use a bit more of a complicated model uh, which included more biological mechanisms in it to make progress so we used a mechanism uh, a model published by alex browning and co-authors in interface in 2020 so this is now an off lattice stochastic individual based model so each cell is its own individual entity it moves around in space it's off lattice now and it can proliferate it can give rise to daughter cells or generate daughter cells and effectively, uh, the local cell density impacts the rate at, at which cells move, and which they proliferate, and also the direction in which they move and um, where they would place its daughter cell, right? So there's some density dependent imp uh, impact in there. 
And in particular, what we do is we impact, uh, quantify the impact of local cell density using what we call a crowding set. So we put like a little sort of kernel, like a little Gaussian at the location of every cell, sum of those up, and that gives us a, a crowding surface. And I think I put this in, but if, if B is the crowding surface, then you can effectively quantify a bias vector by taking the gradient of that crowding surface. And then you can include parameters in your model that tell you whether cells move up or down gradients in essentially local cell density. Um, and you can also control where they place their uh, daughter cells, again, using this crowding surface and the, 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 the shape of this crowding surface. Um, in particular, cells decide where to move and where to place their daughter cells by sampling from a von Mises distribution. Um, and we use effectively the... Um, the bias vector to tell us what the mean is of that mon Mises distribution. So on average, they move up or down gradients in density. And um, the, um, the variance, if you like, of that, so how sharply peaked that von Mises distribution is, is controlled by the magnitude of the bias vector. So effectively, if there are no local gradients in density, then it will just be a normal F, it will just be uniform. And as it gets deeper and as the magnitude of that uh, that um what am i trying to say that bias vector increases it becomes more and more peaked about the mean again movement and proliferation are also the rates and the croissant processes that are controlled by or governed by the local cell density um and so in particular for both movement and proliferation there's basal rates of movement and uh, proliferation and then there's density dependent parameters that modulate those basal rates so if gamma m is positive then cells are less likely to move in regions of high cell density. And if gamma M is negative, cells are more likely to try to move in regions of high cell density. And same goes for proliferation. And we also include death because in some of our data, we can see that the number of cells is decreasing over time. All right, so we have a model. What about the data? So this is definitely a case in which the data set was so big, right? We've got hundreds of thousands of images that it wasn't possible to make progress without some kind of automated uh, approach to extract numbers from the data. So we collaborated with Heba Salem, who's at our King's College in London, and we used her deep scratch analysis pipeline. So essentially, this is a neural uh, uh, network um, type architecture. And what it does is identifies the location of every cell based on a nucleus stain. And it uses the location of every cell to segment the wound edge. So you can see how big your wound is. And it also uses a Voronoi tessellation uh, to tell you approximately how big the cells were. So effectively, we could feed all our images through this pipeline and know where every cell is, you know, count all our cells, know how big they are and how big the wound is. And I should say, so without this, this is one of those Here's the, the, one of the machine learning crucial bits of this. Without this, we, it, this study just wasn't going to be possible. OK, so we've got the model. We've got the data. Where do we go from there? Um, we wanted to do parameter inference again using our Bayesian framework. But this time, we've got six parameters on model. So the, the kind of the challenge is on. Um, it wasn't necessarily going to be um, a problem were it not for two things. Um, the first is potentially that we've only got one data point for each assay. So we've got a snapshot at time zero, which we need to use to initialize the model. And then we simulate the model forward for 24 hours. So then we've only got one kind of data point to compare between model and uh, our, our model output with. So we've got a lot of parameters and, and not necessarily a huge amount of data in terms of time resolution. But what we do have, on the other hand, is huge numbers of replicates. So some of our different gene knockdowns, we had about 130 different instances of this assay. Again, that wouldn't necessarily be a problem if it weren't for the fact that there was huge variability in the initial room size. So if you make, if you actually make these scratches uh, with a the pipette tip, they can, you know, they, they can vary quite a lot. Um, and that meant that every time we did a round of approximate Bayesian computation, we simulated, we did, sampled a parameter set and we simulated, we had to simulate the model 100 or 130 times for that one parameter set. And given that we need to maybe sample more than a million parameters, there was a lot of simulation that needed to take place. Um, and essentially, that just wasn't going to work. Um, even with kind of ARC or HBC compute resources, it wasn't going to be possible. So we had to come up with a new approach. And so what Simon, the PhD student on this project, came up with was um, a new variant of approximate Bayesian computation um, that was kind of 
really made use of this big, big data set in a, in a kind of clever way. And it does so using ideas from stochastic gradient descent. So we've got our regular standard vanilla ABC algorithm. And the idea is that every time you sample a parameter set from the prior distribution, you also sample a mini match of your data. So if you've got 100 replicates of your data, you might just sample 10 of them uniformly at random. And then you basically use that set of 10 with that parameter set to make progress. So you simulate the model using the parameter set. You do that for each sample from the mini batch individually, but you're only doing 10 rather than 100 simulations at this point. You evaluate distance between model and data, again, on a one by one basis for each sample from the mini batch individually. And then you assign the weight to your parameter value using some combination of those results. Okay. So the good thing about this is that you can, depending on how many uh, samples you have in your mini batch, you can really reduce the, the cost of your algorithm by a, a huge amount. But because every time you sample a mini batch of the data, you do it with replacement, um, your, your algorithm is seeing all of the data, right? <laughs> many times. And in fact, right, the chance of it not seeing all the data sets is kind of vanishingly small um, over the number of samples that we drew. What does what does it all tell us, I guess, is the question. So these are marginal posterior distributions um, for the different model parameters. So I've got basal motility, net proliferation, so birth minus death. Um, this parameter relating to contact mediation of motility, contact mediation of proliferation and motility bias. So the two on the right, we can't really get very precise estimates for. So we, that's a kind of a work in progress. Um, but the three on the left do tell us quite a bit. And in particular, I want to focus on this uh, middle plot, which is the parameter, the gamma M, which relates to contact mediation of cell motility. What you can see is in wild types, this is blue, so no gene perturbations, this parameter is, is, is negative. Okay, we've got fairly good estimates of it. Um, and this tells us that motility is strongly upregulated in regions of high cell density. Cells are basically trying to move to less dense areas, right? Okay, um, and, and, and this is really the case compared with knockdowns in CDH5 and CDC42, so two different genes. Why is that reassuring since it's just a subset of the results? Well, that's consistent with current understanding of the roles of CDC42 and CDH5. So we know that CDC42, uh, or loss of its expression, is associated with defects in cell polarity and cell migration, just saying that it really does, they find it harder to know where to go. Um, and knockdowns in CDH5 well, it's, it's um, involved in cell adhesion turnover. So again, consistent with the fact that cells can't essentially let go of their neighbors to be able to move more when the density gets high. Okay, so if we look at wild type and if we look at TG knockdowns, this thing seems to be telling us something sensible. Okay, what happens to the rest of the genes? This slide is up here to show you that it's a nightmare and a mess still to deal with, right? Because we've got hundreds of different knockdowns and what do we do? Um, so we couldn't interpret the whole lot um, very easily. So what we did was use k-means clustering to establish that there are three main clusters in phenotype space. And I'm just going to show you a much nicer plot, which shows you what those clusters look like as a function of these three kind of identifiable parameters. So this is basal motility, net proliferation, and contact mediation of motility. Okay, so we see we've got clusters that sit in different areas of Phen uh, phenotype space. So we can essentially, at this point, understand that we can distinguish between um, these different aspects of accelerated or decelerated wound healing based on what's happening with the cell phenotype. So we can do this genotype to phenotype mapping. In particular, if you look at USP18 and FA7, so these are gene knockdowns, um, you can see that they belong to different clusters, one up here and one down there. And if you just eyeball the images, which is what the original study did, really all you can tell is that wound healing is perturbed, it's delayed essentially in both of those gene knockdowns. Um, but if you look at what's happening or where they sit in this phenotype space, you can see that USP18 um, leads to kind of delayed wound closure, essentially because this contact mediation of motility parameter is positive and high, which means that cells essentially can't uh, get away from their neighbors, suggesting a role again for cell uh, USP18 in cell adhesion turnover. On the other hand, for FA7, sits right down here, um, and we're kind of going to predict then that in phenotype space, uh, we've got a very low or maybe slightly negative value for the net proliferation rate. So, on average, cells are not proliferating or they're dying off over the course of the experiments. 
and that FA7 has relatively low cell motility. Again, uh, providing a mechanistic explanation for, for why they're delaying wound healing. And that's all consistent with what we know about those two genes. And on the other hand, for ITPR1, which is, sits in the other cluster, you can see that wound healing is, is, is really good. And we can predict that's because cells, essentially this contact mediation of motility parameter is very high in negative. Cells want to move into regions of space, if you like. Um, and that also it's got a very high value for the net proliferation parameter. Well, we know that ITPR1 essentially controls apoptosis, so that's consistent with what we know. Um, but the, the um, contact mediation uh, um, is something that we, we predict with this model. Okay, so as a summary, um, what I think this part of the talk shows is that it's possible to calibrate much more complicated models to data and use them to provide new biological insights. Um, and in this particular case, I think being able to do this needed two new advances, right? And they were both made possible using machine learning approaches. The first was um, this automated method to essentially identify the cells um, and to segment the edge of the wound to provide essentially the numbers from the data, the imaging data. Um, and the second advance was a novel variant of ABC that can utilize uh, the full data set very, very um, efficiently. Okay, so machine learning and tandem with computational statistics tools can be quite useful. All right, um, the last bit, I'm gonna maybe just show you a brief overview of, because I recognize that it's uh, time is ticking. The kind of, what we've done so far, right, is either, take an existing off the shelf model that was quite tightly defined and connect it with data using computational statistics approaches. And then we kind of moved that upper level to take a model that was more flexible that it could incorporate more biological mechanisms and connect it with data using um, machine learning based approaches. Uh, but another question you, ha you might have is, did, do we sort of need to do that or given enough data, can we learn the model directly from the data? So this is what this last bit begins to think about. So this is going to be work that's based on um, things published by um, Sim Rudy and Nathan Kutz. Um, so building on the Cindy algorithm, if you've heard of it, and PDE finds those published in Science Advances. So we first of all, so we're thinking about how to learn um, individual based models a little bit at the moment, but this was about how to learn PDE models for some of these experiments using um, uh, an, an algorithm known as PDE find. So the way in which PDE find makes progress is it says, assume I've got some governing PDE, like at the top of the slide, um, and that might be you at this point probably represent something like cell density. And it says, well, I'm gonna try and decompose the right-hand side of my model as a combination of different live terms. So essentially a term that might be UXX, times a coefficient xi four or something like that. So we've got a sum of different terms. And the right-hand side is sort of sufficiently general that it can capture lots of different biological mechanisms. So the idea is really to estimate what the optimal coefficients are that multiply, and again, <laughs> multiply each of these terms. <laughs> yeah, all right, be careful. What do I say? So the idea that um, uh, sort of was presented in, in the Cindy algorithm in PDE find was to estimate those coefficients psi i um, by, by estimating the left and the right hand side terms directly from the data. You assume that you know it, so you have to put in um, your own personal library of terms and again that's a subjective choice and we think about how to do that in a, in a sensible way but you, you give it a, a, a library effectively and it, it tries to choose from them. Um, and I've got some thoughts on that. So the idea is you learn this using sparse regression. What does that really mean? So here's a potential library that we could have all terms up to kind of third order, if you like, polynomial, um, in U, UX, and UXX. That's on the right-hand side of my PDE. Okay. So then what do I do? I basically form a, a really big uh, <laughs> AX equal problem of the form AX equals B, right? Where... Uh, B is effectively an estimate of the time derivative calculated from my data. Um, A is effectively all those library terms evaluated at all space and all time points from my data. And then the X is my coefficients psi, okay? So because I'm estimating it from the data, I know what these are, I know what these are, and I just essentially invert. If I, so I've, I've estimated this directly from data. Um, 
So if I don't use sparse regression, then I would effectively got non-zero uh, terms for each of my XI, which means every one of my single library terms would be in my model, and I would not know learn anything from a mechanistic modeling perspective. So from a modeling perspective, I would just want a small number of these terms. So the idea in the PDE find algorithm is to uh, enforce sparsity by essentially regularizing and using a sequential thresholding algorithm to, to knock out different terms. So you're hopefully at the end of the day only left with a, a small handful on the right hand side. So let's see how well it does. So mostly when this algorithm was developed, it was developed in the, um, by generating data from using a PDE model, adding a little bit of noise to it, and then seeing if you could learn the PDE. We wanted to first ask the question, what happens if you have kind of noisy data from an agent-based model, which simulates an experiment? So we went right back to the first model, um, which was simulating these sort of growth to confluence experiments. We've got an exclusion process model on a lattice. Cells can move up, down, left, or right. Um, they can proliferate, give rise to daughter cells. And you can, if you want, have movement in the left-right direction to be biased. The reason for choosing this is that we know that they've got uh, limiting PDE models. And in particular, if you choose your initial condition sensibly, you've got a one-dimensional PDE that approximates the density and how it evolves over time. It looks like that. And you can directly connect the parameters of your PDE model, so D, V, and P, to parameters of your individual-based model, P, M, P, P, and Rho. So we knew what PDE we should be shooting for. So we considered three different cases. So effectively, just diffusion, uh, invection diffusion, and um, diffusion reaction equations in here. The details don't matter too much, and I can talk about it more if anyone's interested. Um, we looked at three different cases, um, a noisy case, a smooth case, and what the PDE should look like in either of those cases. And the take home message from this bit, and I'm aware I'm running out of time, so sorry, I'll wrap up now pretty quickly, is that sometimes it does great and it learns a PDE that well approximates the data, so the blue dash lines. Sometimes it's absolutely appalling and it learns a PDE that has no relation to the data um, and everything in between, right? And every time you do it, you get a different set of coefficients and you, um, they, you know, and so, so even like which coefficients it picks out will be different and, and they're all different values. So it, it wasn't bad. Um, so the pros and cons are, um, you know, in the limits of large amounts of data, this works a treat. Um, it can really quickly sift through huge numbers of hypothesized terms. So your library can be really pretty big and it doesn't really care. Um, but it struggles in the face of realistic noise. And it, from our perspective, the important thing is it doesn't tell you anything about the uncertainty of the learned equation. So how certain are you in the model that you've actually learned? Because you're going to use that going forward. You should hope that you, you're confident in it. So how can we play to its strengths and provide a measure of uncertainty? So very, very quickly, what we proposed is a, a, a base version of this, UQ for PDE find, where effectively we use PDE find on lots and lots of different noisy data sets to quickly sift through and find candidate models, okay? And formally what we use is um, what we call an identification ratio, uh, ratio. So if we apply PDE find to 100 different noisy data sets, how many times do we pick up each of those library terms on the right-hand side? And then we use that identification ratio to form a sparse prior for subsequent Bayesian inference. So effectively you use a stick and sub prior. So part of it is just uh, sat at zero. So you can get rid of a term in the model. And then we've got a normal bit that sits away from zero. So the good thing now, we only have to conduct Bayesian inference for a model with a much lower dimensional parameter space. Um, and we can pick out different terms. Short answer of the short story in the results. And again, I'm happy to talk about this to anyone in more detail is that um, essentially, what this gives you is an informed prior for Bayesian inference that helps you to maintain the correct equation structure. Um, it performs pretty well as long as you've got suitable experimental design and it provides significant speed ups compared to standard approaches. So it's really, really early days. I wouldn't say we were great at doing this yet, but I think there is some hope in, in, in being able to learn uh, governing equations if you have access to enough data, and that's often a big if. Okay. So I'm going to finish up really quickly and just say that um, I really think large amounts of quantitative data give us huge opportunities in sort of cell developmental biology and, and other fields of biology. But I think that 
if we just use traditional mechanistic modeling approaches on their own, they might fail to fully capitalize on them. But, uh, you know, as I've tried to illustrate by a number of different examples, um, integrating tools from you know, computational statistics, machine learning can help with some of that. So in particular, we're beginning to rely on it more and more for data analysis. Um, obviously, for calibrating models to data and doing that efficiently. Um, and I'll talk about more about this tomorrow, but we're also really, really starting to think about how we might use um, these sort of techniques and ideas to inform uh, kind of what the right level of a model might be for the data and then for experimental design as well. So I'm going to stop there. Um, there's just uh, a lot of people on the, on, the, on the slide who contributed and helped in different ways to this work. So thanks to them um, and to funders and to you for listening. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, so we have some time for questions and um, I'm going to start because I'm perfect. So, <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about in the last bit of the work where you're learning coefficients yeah. of a MOSH. And so you looked at it in PDEs. And so sometimes in PDEs, so I'm not sure exactly the ones that you're working with, the parameter values themselves are not necessarily or I don't know how to say this in the correct way, maybe, but there may be some normalization. So the parameters end up maybe to be zero and one or something like this. But if we're trying to learn like an ODE type model with mechanism, mm -hmm. we have units in the parameters. What is it like the philosophical view of where we are in terms of understanding and inferring models that are interpretable with parameters that are experimentally Range over. Do you say parameters that range over large sort of? Yeah, like or whatever. Be, and, and then like, for example, we go to our collaborators and say, okay, well, you know, these parameters that match to exactly this mm. biological problem. Yeah, I think, I think maybe there's a couple of bits to that. Um, the first thing I would say is that I think we always have to be really careful that a parameter generally is specific to a model. So if I change, so this model has exclusion in it. So if cells try to move into the same lattice sites, they abort that movement attempt. I could also kind of come up with a model where I can have many as many cells as I want per lattice site. So I zoom out or maybe there's cap. And so in each of those different models, these parameters have a slightly different interpretation. And so they will be estimated differently. And I think you just have to be really careful to, to make clear that that's the case. And so, you know, if we're talking about Young's modulus or something like that, it's very clear that that, that you know, that's one and the same, hopefully. Um, but but they aren't always in models. So maybe in different models, we have to look at relative sizes of parameter values or relative magnitude of contributions. Um, so yeah, I think that's really important. I think one of the things that worries me about this, and I've forgotten where it says it on the slide, is that, in this algorithm, um, they enforce sparsity and they use sequential thresholding, right? So there's two, two bits to that. Number one is how to choose how big your regulation parameters should be, or three bits maybe. Number two is to choose um, <laughs> the, 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 the norm here. And number three is to, you, to choose your um, threshold for sequential thresholding. And all of those will have an impact on the model that you learn. And so I think you have to be really, really careful <laughs> in how you how you choose those right because often in a model in, you know if I'm looking at some cell cell biology system my my um, diffusion coefficient and my proliferation rate parameters will be quite different orders of magnitude I think there's a danger with sequential thresholding that I'll chop off one of them get rid of it so I think you have to be careful about that partly I think that can be mitigated by having access to the right data so in the study and I didn't say it I just kind of alluded to it is that in this drift diffusion uh, case, right, you should have a non-linearity. So the um, the drift term should be u times one minus u. We never picked up the, the kind of u squared contribution of that because it just wasn't a signature in the data. So the experiment that we'd used from the start was not one that was gonna ever allow us to pick up that term. So I think in that context, it's about then saying, how do I design an experiment that shows me that that's relevant? Um, so I'm not sure if I answered the question no, a bit over the place, but it's okay. Another question? Yeah, Paul. Uh, there is something always very striking in what you showed is that your your parameter space or data space you know, is very orthogonal. So, for instance, like you were showing your, very, your initial model, you had two parameters, and then once one type of myself. observable give, was giving you one parameter, and the other type of observable will give, will give you another another parameter. This one, so well, it's coming. I've got share screen again. Have a nine. Give me a second. <laughs> 
shouldn't have stopped. You mean in this? Uh, yeah, it was one very, very early example. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Very thing. yeah. yeah this is, one. So what is very striking is that you have vertical line and horizontal line. Yeah. So it seems very, very, you know, orthogonal. Of course, the model is very coarse grain and very simple, but usually what would happen in more complicated model that you could predict, for instance, a product of parameters, but not really the individual values. Yeah. So, so can you comment on that? That's very striking. In, in... So yeah, sorry, I couldn't yeah. be clearer here. I think yeah. that what we're seeing here is that if I just use the number of cells as a summary statistic, yeah. I can nail the proliferation rate. <laughs> yeah. And if I use a distance boost, I nail the movement rate yeah i thought i thought it would be curved i thought it would be like yeah, that right yeah. and then like fisher fisher's equation would tell you that that's what you might predict um this is the closest we came and like, i yeah. thought poor andrew the phd student i was like can you just go and do this again can you do this again because i think it should i think we should get a like a yeah. kind of banana shape and we don't i mean the it's it's not right you're just not seeing anything here right instead of seeing that banana i suspect i suspect it's I don't know. Like, if I go back to sorry, I mean, like, if I go back to this, this is why I really thought you would see this trade-off between movement and proliferation because of the clustering. Um, I don't quite know why this signature is not there. I suspect it might be, it might be just due to collecting data that's not quite in the sweet spot of when this happens, right, and when this is important. So again, I think it goes back to the idea of you've got to have the right data to be able to see that effect being important. But yeah, no, you're right. But if I ask the question differently, like maybe in some other problems, you might want to change your observable snapping point to a given parameter. So is that yeah. a good way to do you know, this kind of inverse question like this, like instead of fitting data to a parameter, learning what kind of data you need yeah. to acquire to get the proper parameter. So how do you, how can you address that? So we're doing something at the moment. Is there... mm -hmm. I'm not sure I've got any chalk. Um, we are doing something at the moment, and, and you can play this game with the simplest possible model in the world. Um, oh dear, cool, yeah. Um, so, so if you just think about having a logistic model, so this is time, and this is density, it does something like that, yeah? And if you want to measure, <laughs> so it's just um, ut is ru into one minus u on k. If I want to measure the carrying capacity, I just measure here. If I want to measure the growth rate, I measure here. So if you, um, so you can, we're developing some algorithms that optimize when you measure, right? According to some techniques. And if you assume that your noise model is non-correlated, it will put all your data points, half your data points here and half your data points here, really, really close together, really, really close together. But if you then change your um, noise model, um, so that the noise is correlated in time, which it should be in a biological system if you measure very, very frequently. It has, kind of forces those points apart from one another and it forces, it forces these points apart from one another. Because if you measure too closely together, all you're measuring is the, the correlation, not the actual signature in the data. So the so short answer is, yeah, I think we are now trying to say, okay, a priori, how can we predict when it's best to measure? And can we, you know, assume, we have to assume a model, but if I assume a particular model, can I really say, okay, for this parameter, I need to measure here versus this parameter. And we're also trying to learn why, why some measures of when it's best mm -hmm. to measure. Um, so, so basically why, why some um, objective functions return different um, things to one another, basically. So yeah, really good question. And I think that's where we should be going. Uh, maybe we have time for one last question. Or yeah, there's Alison as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'm else to go. Oh, sure. uh, so I'm just to ask you about this um, second part of the talk uh, where you did uh, the uh, k means clustering mm. um, on this knockout and knockdown experiment. Yeah. Um, so you looked at three different features. Are these three features, sorry, maybe you said it and I missed it. I probably Is it them wrong or actually yeah. looking at the data directly and doing the clustering. I, I missed that part. No, so this is, so to, to estimate the posterior distributions, we looked at total number of cells, um, average cell density averaged uh, across the wound, and um, the pairwise correlation distance um, uh, function. So they were the three summary statistics that gave us the posterior distribution. And then what I've plotted here, and not really easy to see, it sort of intentionally is, for each gene knockdown where the mean of the posterior distribution sits 
in a lower dimensional parameter space, right? It's not intentionally designed. I mean, when we first spotted it like this, we spent like, you know, hours just going, can we really learn anything from this? But the idea was that effectively, when we use the k-means clustering, we looked at the posterior mean in this five dimensional parameter space, and we clustered in that five dimensional parameter space. And then I'm just showing you where these points sit in these in this three dimensional um, projection, because um, these are really the parameters that we're confident with. So, so pushing the very aspect of the university process. So instead of doing it that way, um, not why not just looking at the data directly? Use yeah. machine learning, for example, to, to detect specific patterns for all of those genes that exhibit similar type of uh, phenotype, phenotypic mm. yeah, in yeah. cells, and then predict what the parameters are associated with each. Each, um, so one of the things that Heba did, and this is, I think, why she knew about this data set, was that she did apply her um, her algorithm to, 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 to generate lots of statistics, right? So we had loads more than, than I talked about in this data set. And so she'd identified um, genes that had a common signature in that high dimensional space. I think what I want to get out of this is, you know, for a lot of these genes, we don't really know what they do. And so the idea was to ask the question, I've, I've knocked down a given gene. Can I use my model to predict in terms of the biology what it's actually doing, right? And so I can definitely see that it's accelerating or, it, um, you know, perturbing wound closure. I, I can see, because I can see how far apart the cells are, that it might be slightly changing their size or the, the separation distance. But I don't really know. That, that's still not necessarily telling me the mechanism, I think, that, that's happening. So I think you're right. I think you want a combination of both things. One of the things I really don't think we've done well enough here is to use more complicated statistics of the data. So people often ask me, you know, um, if you look at the roughness of the wound edge, actually, that changes between different um, knockdowns. And I think if we focused more on what was going on around the wound edge, we do a much better job at estimating um, these parameters at a moment that are not identifiable. And I think that's because really they only, <laughs> they're only important at the edge of the wound. So um, I think there's loads more that you could do in here, but I think if we only use machine learning, I, I'm worried that we wouldn't get quite as much insight. Yeah, good question. Um, did you want to ask one last yeah. question from Alison? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask something um, going back to the um, ABC, Results yeah. we really took before this this mini badge approach and just this idea that depending on like what you choose <laughs> to put in your synthetic likelihood, like you can kind of get your posterior to be where you know the parameters are or uh not. I guess I wanted to hear more about your experience. Like how do you come up with like what to include in the likelihood? And you just have to include some things with cell movement, which makes it very hard to get experimentally, but like it's kind of there's no like theoretical principle saying what you should include it when you like go this route. So how do you come up with that? Like I understand in this example, you could kind yeah. of directly compare it, but in general, unless you can simulate the model or every possible parameter regime and like repeat that, you won't know what could work or could fail. So how do we like think about that? <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's non-trivial, you're right. Um, I guess by this point, we've worked with this kind of data and these kind of models quite a lot. And um, I think there's a hidden slide somewhere that I won't be able to find now. Um, maybe there isn't. No, I might, maybe it. Yeah, here we go. Um, oh, I'm not sure I've got the right one anyway, sorry. Um, so, no, I've just showed you this one before, haven't I? All right. The, um, we we knew from work that Alex has did that the three summary statistics that we used did quite a good job. So we just used those. Um, there's two things to say, maybe. One is that if you use the vanilla form of mini batch ABC, which is basically ABC rejection with this thing in it, and, and if you use ABC rejection anyway, a kind of quite sensible thing to do is to just um, you know, sample a parameter set, simulate your model, and and it, um generate an absolute uh, generate every summary statistic from that that you can think of and then you can essentially go through those summary statistics and look at which summary statistics kind of are, are essentially informative what gives you um quote unquote a good posterior where you can think about what good is but if you're going to do something like um 
sort of, um, what am I trying to say? If you're going to use a more sophisticated form of ABC, which we had to do here, we didn't quite use this off the, the shelf. Um, we use a sort of sequential Monte Carlo form of it, then you kind of can't do that so easily a priori. So, um, so I think it's very, very difficult. I don't think it's a well-solved question. And at the moment, I sort of feel like we're restricted to using kind of our intuition and thinking about, well, you know, it's only really on the edge of this wound that I see kind of real density gradients. So it's pre presumably it's around the edge of the wound that I'm going to learn about those bias parameters. So I think if we'd have, <laughs> for example, here's a question. If I looked at the edge of the wound and it's kind of how jagged it is, or if I got rid of a lot of the background data, would I actually do a better job in learning the parameters maybe? And we should do that. I think there's also people um, in Oxford and elsewhere who are kind of using neural networks as summary statistics um to try and make progress but we haven't done that so i think it's you know if you've got ideas i'd love to hit chat at some point but i don't have the answer well let's thank you again